I'm currently at a reasonable body fat percentage. Not super lean, but also not too high in body fat. Fat to estimate, somewhere in the ballpark of 8-12% to body fat. Today, I'm reacting to Shauna Alanage video titled How to Gain Muscle and Lose Fat at the Same Time. Real Truth. I'll be giving my take on whether or not Sean's advice is practical, solid, and will actually help you build muscle. I'm involved in ongoing research in hypertrophy training and I have a PhD in exercise science. So I'll be reviewing his claims from an exercise science perspective. So the million dollar question, how do you gain muscle and lose fat at the same time? Is it really possible? And if so, what is the most effective way to go about it? Well, the truth is that there's a lot of myths floating around out there on the subject of body recomposition. And if you don't have a proper understanding of how the process actually works, you could easily end up wasting a ton of unnecessary time and effort, spinning your wheels and potentially not getting anywhere. So let's quickly break this down. By the end of this video, I promise it will all make sense. You'll see just how straightforward the subject actually is, and you'll know exactly how to proceed with your own program as far as bulking, cutting, or recompositioning are concerned. So first off, is body recomposition possible to begin with, or is it just a bunch of overhyped BS? Well, the answer is that yes, it is possible, and the overall process is pretty simple. You break down stored fat through a calorie deficit, and then with a proper training stimulus in place, your body can use some of the calories from that fat along with your protein intake to fuel additional muscle growth. So it is doable. However, and this is a big however, the degree to which this will actually occur, the amount of muscle you can actually put on while also losing fat, that's going to be highly dependent on you as an individual. So far, I am nodding along. Body recomposition, as Sean says, is absolutely possible. As he mentions, it is also highly dependent on you as an individual and a number of circumstances and a number of factors about you. Let me give some additional context in the research. First, nearly every study in exercise science, testing out different workout protocols and seeing which one works better, instructs participants to roughly maintain their weight. And we record their body weights before the study and before the training intervention and afterwards. And nearly inevitably, they hover right around maintenance, meaning they don't gain or lose an appreciable amount of weight. But guess what? During these same studies, we observe that their body fat goes down and their muscle mass increases. And this happens not just in beginners, but also in more trained populations. To give you a more formal or eye-catching example, a meta-regression by Murphy and colleagues tried to plot the relationship between how big of a deficit you were in and how that impacted your lean body mass gains across a training program. And the studies included when up to in a 500 calorie deficit, people were still able to gain lean body mass. So not only can you clearly recompose maintenance, gain muscle and lose fat at the same time, because your body is drawing calories from fat tissue and effectively using those calories to build muscle mass. Your body can source calories endogenously, as opposed to getting exogenously through food, for instance. But even in a slight deficit, you can absolutely build muscle and lose fat. That much is not really a disputable fact. In fact, we can go further and say that the average person is able to, not just a small proportion of the population. Number two, the extent to which you will be able to recomp does likely depend on a variety of factors. And the number of factors is so long, I'm not going to list them all. That is a rough concept. You can view each of these factors and how you stack up on them as determining where on the spectrum of propensity to build muscle you fall. These questions include, but are not limited to, are you currently using steroids? How good is genetics? How long have you been lifting for? How old are you? How good is your nutrition? How high is your protein intake? How effective is your training program? Do you take the right supplements? There are literally dozens of questions like these, which will all together determine where you fall on the propensity to build muscle spectrum. And the better you stack up on that overall spectrum, the better your results will be, whether you're in a bulk, in a cut, or at maintenance and trying to recomp. The average individual should be able to recomp. There are going to be cases where recomp is difficult or impossible based on how you fall within those categories. Number three, and I think this is an important one that common gym lore doesn't really observe. I don't think that how advanced you are will really determine inherently whether you can or cannot recomp. You see, most people think that you can only recomp if you're a beginner. But as you grow more advanced, if you stay at maintenance, you're not going to lose any fat and you're not going to build any muscle. However, many studies in exercise science do look at trained lifters. And even when these trained lifters stay at maintenance calories, if they follow an effective training program, they are able to gain strength and size while losing fat. So instead of advanced lifters cannot recomp, what is more likely true is that the magnitude of hypertrophy simply downshifts. As you get more trained, you grow less muscle in general. So just like you'd be gaining less muscle during a bulk, you also gain less muscle at maintenance when recomping. And so the pace of change in your physique is slow enough that it can feel like it's not working. But guess what? Once you've been lifting for a few years, even if you were bulking, you wouldn't see that much of a change anyways. Progress simply takes time, but recomping can absolutely work for more advanced individuals. And that's great news because oftentimes staying around maintenance calories is more sustainable for many people, isn't as much of a hassle as getting into a surplus to a deficit. And oftentimes, number three, allows you to set up more sustainable and healthy habits. It allows you to focus on physical 
activity year-round, as opposed to down-regulating physical activity during a bulk to make it easier to get into a surplus, and then up-regulating it massively during a deficit to burn more calories. It makes your diet more stable. You can focus on getting plenty of fiber into your diet, plenty of servings of fruits and vegetables consistently. Your dietary habits don't change a ton because you're bulking versus cutting. You can simply focus on setting up a healthy, sustainable routine. And compared to bulking and cutting repeatedly, I don't think your hypertrophy is going to be impacted much, if at all. Because the research on bulking doesn't support that there's a huge benefit of bulking. Now, don't get me wrong. There's not that much research on bulking just yet. But the research that is there, and we have two studies and more train lifters, suggests that broadly speaking, maintenance can lead to similar or just slightly worse hypertrophy compared to bulking. So if you say, hey, I'm pretty close to my long-term weight goal. That's close to my long-term natural potential, as estimated via the Casey Butts formula, for instance. I just want to maintain at this weight forever. Will I reach close to my natural potential? My honest answer from the research and from my experience is going to be yes. And I think it's a great approach for many people. Now, obviously, if you're far below your target goal weight or your natural potential, maintaining your weight to your natural potential isn't going to happen. You need to gain weight at some point. But let's keep watching. If you want to level up your training, check out MyAdapt, the app I co-founded to help you apply the science from this channel. It builds evidence-based routines around progressive overload and smart exercise selection, lets you emphasize the muscles you care about, and tracks progress automatically. Train anywhere, at home or in a gym, in as little as 15 minutes, and switch between gym seamlessly. Head to myapp.com and use code WOLF for a free two-week trial. You can also book a free call below to see if we're a good fit. I'll work with you directly to optimize your training, nutrition, and recovery. Big thank you as always to Rascal Apparel for supporting the channel. You can use code WOLF for 10% off their training gear at rascalapparel.com. Anybody who just gives one sweeping answer across the board that yes, you can gain muscle and lose fat at the same time, end of story. So that's what your goal should be because everybody can do it. They're not giving you the best information because it will vary quite a bit from person to person and depend on two main factors. The first factor is body fat percentage. Fat is ultimately a stored form of energy that your body requires for survival. And so the leaner you are, the less willing your body will be to divert that fat toward building new muscle tissue, because at that point, it's already fighting to hold on to the remaining stores. Plus muscle also requires additional calories to be maintained after it's already built. So for example, at 10% body fat and below, you're likely not going to be gaining any real muscle while trying to get increasingly leaner. And in fact, you might even start losing muscle at that point as you cut further. Whereas if you've spent the last eight months on a steady diet of fried mayonnaise balls and you've dirty bulked yourself up to 30% body fat, then you'll have plenty of results reserves in the tank. Your body isn't in any kind of immediate survival mode at that point, and so building significant muscle while dropping fat is going to be much more realistic. And then everything in between those points, from very lean to very not lean, the muscle growth potential will operate along a spectrum. Real ones will know slathering a food in mayonnaise to fry it or even sear it is actually a great way to do things. So hey, Sean was onto something. On a more serious note, I agree that directionally, the leaner you are, the harder recomp becomes. Not just because you don't have as much fat around to extract calories from to use for the muscle growth process. Because in actuality, the muscle growth process only takes an extra 20 to maybe 50 calories per day. But more so because being too lean and being in relative energy deficiency can compromise many things about your life, including your training quality, your mood, your joint pains, etc. So you definitely want to be in a sustainable body fat percentage if you're going to attempt to recomp. Because no, recomping probably isn't the ticket to going from, say, 12% body fat as a man to 6% over a few years. So yeah, yet again, Sean's on the money. And then the second main factor is going to be training experience. So the longer you've been properly lifting for and the more muscle you're already carrying, the harder it's going to be to put on additional muscle, even if you're in a calorie surplus, let alone while also trying to lose fat. Whereas for a beginner, weight training is going to be a novel stimulus. It'll be treated by the body as a more serious threat, and it will react more strongly to that and be more incentivized to build new muscle as an adaptive response. And once again, this is all going to work along a spectrum. Someone who's never touched a weight before in their life, aka 95% of the comment section in TikTok fitness, those people will have the highest chances for successfully recomping. Whereas for someone with five plus years of consistent hard training under their belt, it's gonna be a lot more difficult. And then everything in between, that's gonna involve varying degrees. Hey, look at us. Sean and I, both on the spectrum, talking about the spectrum. This is uh, right up my alley. On a serious note, as I mentioned, I think training experience plays a role in terms of how much muscle we will build during recomp, bulking, or cutting, but I don't think it will determine as an on and off switch whether or not you are able to recomp. We know both from empirical findings and from basic physiology that whether you're, say, exactly at maintenance, or in a one calorie surplus, or in a one calorie deficit, doesn't switch on or off the muscle growth process entirely. Likewise, being more advanced likely doesn't work that way either. It is simply one factor in quite a multifactorial 
complex set of physiological processes. And I don't personally think at this stage we can say that bulking and cutting is going to be long-term much more beneficial, if at all, compared to simply maintaining at a reasonable body fat percentage at a reasonable weight for an advanced lifter. Because again, the muscle growth process doesn't take that many calories, and training is fundamentally the stimulus for inducing hypertrophy. Nutrition is only really permissive of the hypertrophy stimulus. I mean, as long as you're doing things reasonably well, hypertrophy will likely occur. This all might seem a little bit gray area right now, but stick with me because you're going to see in a minute how it all ties together and how to actually apply it. But to sum that up, the people who will be able to recomposition with the highest degree of success by gaining the most muscle while also losing fat are going to be beginning lifters with a high body fat percentage. So either overweight or skinny fat. And then on the opposite end are going to be more advanced lifters at leaner body fat percentages. And then everything in between will produce varying results that can't specifically be quantified. Not to mention that genetics are also going to play a role in this as well. And keep in mind that we're talking about natural lifters here since pharmaceutical assistance will of course influence things too. Now, if you don't fall onto one of those two sides of the spectrum, so you're not a beginner with high body fat or an advanced lifter with low body fat, you're just kind of somewhere in the middle, you're probably wondering how to go about this because you don't know exactly what degree of recompositioning is really possible for you. However, and this is what most people get wrong on this, it doesn't actually matter in practical terms or affect how you should go about things. And the reason for that is that there's no such thing as a body recomposition program in the first place. There's no special recomp training routine or recomp diet you need to follow because recomping is not something you can specifically force. And instead, it's just something that happens naturally on its own. Recomping means what? It means that you lose fat and you gain muscle at the same time. And what is non-negotiable rule number one when it comes to losing fat? It's that you have to be in a calorie deficit. And there's no way around that because you're body has no need to break down stored fat without one. One good thing, one bad thing, and what Sean is saying here. The good thing is that I agree that the workout program does not need to change whether you're in a bulk, at maintenance, or in a deficit. Now, you could argue that when you're in a deficit, your recovery slows down, and that therefore the training volume or the training intensity, proximity to failure on each set, should decrease slightly to accommodate for the slow recovery. Vice versa, in a bulk or even at maintenance, you might be able to push those a bit more. And that may or may not be true, but surprisingly, the research isn't that clear yet, especially in the context of more moderate deficits, say around a 500 calorie deficit or a bit more. Now sure, if you're in a state of low energy availability or relative energy deficiency, things that we've studied in exercise science that occur when your calorie intake is very low, then your recovery does likely take a hit. But in the context of what most people are doing, you know, modest surpluses, maintenance, modest deficit, I don't think your recovery is going to be night and day different. And so for the time being, honestly, I don't think your workout program should change much, if at all, in a bulk versus in a cut. The second thing where I somewhat disagree with Sean here is that you are able to lose fat and gain muscle at maintenance. You do not need to be in a calorie deficit to lose fat, where when eating at maintenance, participants stay the same weight, but were able to gain muscle, suggesting they were at the same time losing fat. And the same applies to more moderate surpluses. Because again, how many calories you consume is only one factor that determines how likely you are to gain muscle and how likely you are to lose fat. This idea that you commonly hear about recomping at maintenance or God forbid recomping in a surplus, that doesn't actually make sense because a calorie deficit has to be in place for fat to be lost. When it all comes down to it, a recomp is essentially no different from a regular fat loss phase. You get into a calorie deficit around 500 give or take below maintenance is pretty standard in most cases. You consume sufficient protein, so no less than 0.8 grams per pound of body weight daily as a minimum. If you want to fully maximize the chances of putting on muscle while in that deficit, then you can bump it up a bit higher to around one gram or more. So that's going to be the basics for your diet. You you pair that up with a proper weight training program where you're training hard with a focus on progressive overload. None of this lightweight, high rep, low rest period nonsense. Can you just keep training in the same basic way as you always do? Throw in some optional cardio as an extra calorie burning tool without going overboard. Get in your high quality sleep. Add in a few basic supplements if they suit your needs. Real science athletics, of course. It's just a regular cutting phase you'd normally do. And then from there, depending on your individual condition in terms of existing fat stores, muscle mass, and genetics, any potential muscle that can be gained during that period will simply happen as an automatic byproduct. Okay, that's really all there is to it. A recomp is a cutting phase where additional muscle growth occurs on its own if the conditions are in place for it. This is one aspect where I disagree with Sean. As I mentioned, the research is pretty clear that even when eating a calorie maintenance, you are able to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. I think there's a slight case of shifting goalposts or redefining what something really means here. As Sean actually defined himself earlier, a body recomposition phase is simply a phase where you're gaining muscle and losing fat at the same time. 
that process can occur not just in a deficit and not just in a deficit of 500 calories like Sean is prescribing here, but rather in a variety of circumstances. And it's not that unlikely to even happen at maintenance calories, as is evidenced in the research. In fact, look at most of the lifters in your gym. If they've been there for 10, 20 years, ask them how their body weights have changed over the decades. Chances are they'll tell you, yeah, I bulked initially, but now for the past several years, I've kind of just been sticking at the same weight. And guess what? They're still making slow, consistent progress. They've still gotten a bit leaner, a bit more jacked over the years. Don't get me wrong. While a large chunk of people is definitely going through bulking and cutting phases and seeing progress as a result, gaining muscle during a bulk and then losing fat during a cut, there is a very non-negligible portion of people out there, regular gym goers, even more serious gym goers, who are just maintaining at a reasonable body weight, reasonable body fat, putting on muscle and losing fat at the same time. Leaner is your main priority right now. Whether you're overweight or skinny fat, or you're a more experienced lifter who's coming off of a bulk, go ahead and shift into that fat loss phase. Maybe you'll put on some additional muscle during that time and maybe you won't. That's not within your control aside from just implementing a properly structured cut in general. And then once you've reached your desired level of leanness, you can reassess from there in terms of what your next goal is, whether it's to just maintain for a while or to shift into a focused bulking phase. But body recomposition in and of itself, that's not something you can specifically train or eat for. It's just something that happens automatically for some people as they lose body fat in a calorie deficit. So what's my personal summary on Sean Nalewanich? Let me check how that's actually pronounced. Let's do it in real time. Sean Nalewanich pronunciation. Actually, let me do a print. Uh, let me do Google Translate for the authentic pronunciation. Now they want each. Let's see. Nail winage. Do I trust it? Fuck it. Sean Nelewanich or Nail Winage. Not sure which one it is. What do I think about his advice overall and his advice in this video? I think Sean's advice is usually spot on. There are exceptions. I think his advice tends to err on the side of being simple, but at the expense of nuance and some degree of accuracy sometimes. I think the average lifter listening to Sean will, on average, make more good training and nutrition decisions than bad training and nutrition decisions. So, I'm personally a fan of Sean's. I certainly don't agree with everything on him, and I'm sure we have differences on training volume, for example, or the stretch, I wouldn't be surprised, but I do think he's generally solid. So what do you think? Is Sean a good source? Was I fair in my rebuttals? Let me know down below. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you guys in that next one. Peace.